Bible tonight, raise your hand. Uh, we are going to be in a couple different scriptures tonight, but um, the main scripture is John chapter 14, verse 6. Um, I want to encourage you, you know, and, and I did uh, reinforce this this morning, but just in case uh, you weren't with us, um, glad you're here tonight. I hope that you've been blessed this summer with uh, the summer series and uh, the barbecue afterwards. Uh, it's a great opportunity to have Vince Vitale with us, and I'm sure that everybody here has an atheist or agnostic friend who really does believe, they do believe that science and God, the belief in God are incompatible. Um, and, uh, you know, Vince is, uh, I think, one of the brightest young Christian minds on the scene today. And it's a wonderful opportunity for you to bring that unbelieving uh, family member or friend and just, you know, take a step of faith and see what God is going to do in their life. I know that um, it's going to be a great night. Uh, so just encourage you guys uh, to, um, to bring those people that you know that need the Lord. And then also tonight, I'm not sure if we've got the, uh, the uh, slide. I know we've started the keynote already, but Tony, can you throw the slide up there for our church planning uh, people if he has it? I just uh, want to mention tonight that we have a school of church planting in Mexico at our training center. Uh, our training center does a lot of things, you know, uh, but one thing that it does, and really the most important thing from our perspective that our training center does, is it, it trains church planters. And so two months out of the year, while we're hosting short-term missions teams over the summer, uh, we have a two-month really uh, in-depth course that we offer to prospective church planters, and we've been doing it for about six years or so. Um, I want to encourage you guys, like this is the fruit of your ministry, this is the fruit of your labor of love, your prayer, your investment in Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, and God has used you um, over the course of the last six years to plant over 40 churches in Mexico, which is, which is pretty awesome, so congratulations, I think it's great. And, uh, you know, we partner with other churches. We believe strongly in collaboration, and we're, um, you know, for our training center at least, the, the vision is to um, support church planners that are being raised up in churches. And so typically, over the course of the last five years or so, the majority of those people have come from uh, the Tijuana, Rosarito area with some few exceptions. This year, these are our church planters, uh, and they are from all over Mexico. So Hermosillo, Monterey, uh, Mexico City, Oaxaca, um, and so I want to encourage you guys, please, they just started. Uh, church planning is one of the most exciting things, and it is also a massive spiritual battle, and so while God is going to do a great work in all of their lives, we believe uh, they're also going to be going through it, and then at the end of the two months, we're going to be part of collaborating with their local churches to plant them in the cities that God has called them to plant churches in. So that's them, and um, I, I think uh, we have their pictures on our website as well, and possibly on the app. Uh, yep, Tony gave a thumbs up for both those things. So I just want to encourage you guys to pray for them uh, once a day. Can you do that for the next two months? Can you? Will you? Will you? Will you? Look at you. You're not even saying yes. Will you? Oh, uh, you're the best. All right. You ready for tonight? Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, so much for your word, and uh, we pray, God, in each of these challenging, not necessarily difficult, but challenging topics to handle, that you'd give us wisdom, that your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. God, that you'd give us your heart, not just to know the truth and to be able to convey the truth, and, um, and even sometimes to argue for the truth, but God, we would care about people, that there is always a soul behind every question that needs Jesus, and that we would not just be interested in winning the argument or having the upper hand, um, but God, that we would be humble and that we would deliver the truth in love. And Father, tonight we just pray that our understanding of world religions would just be clarified. If there's confusion in this room, tonight I pray that your truth would just pierce through that and the, that you'd help us to see things the way you see them. I pray, God, that we would be unashamed of the truth of your word, that we would stand strong, solidly on the eternal word of God, and that, uh, God, in this season that you have allowed us to live, that, that our lives would be used to draw people into your kingdom. God, use us 
to see a harvest of souls, one to you, and one day worshiping in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Calvin Shank said, religious plurality poses the biggest challenge for Christian churches and Christian theology today. It's a big statement, and it was re recently made. Um, and I don't think that it's necessarily an overstatement. I think that in many ways it's true. I'm going to explain that in, in just a minute. Um, but religious pr plurality, the, uh, the exposure, you know, pluralism in religion has always existed, but the exposure to it has definitely increased uh, in the last generation. And in many ways, it does pose a challenge. It doesn't pose a threat. It's not something to necessarily be afraid of. Um, but it is a challenge for churches. It is a challenge for Christians. And it is, it is a challenge for Christian theology. And, you know, one of the reasons that that's the case is Christians today, unfortunately, and this is going to sound maybe kind of negative, but I think sometimes Christians, unfortunately, today um, are biblically illiterate. And because there is a, 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 a biblical illiteracy among Christians, Christians can be susceptible to things that are false. And so, you know, the issue of religious pluralism and how we handle different religions, and is it possible for them to coexist, and what exactly does coexist mean? You know, it's important for us to be able to handle this question effectively as believers, and, you know, that really is uh, the, fo the focal point for us tonight. If you're taking notes tonight, there's four things there's four things, you know, with respect to this issue, as challenging as it is and as important as it is for you to have this under your spiritual belt, there are four things for us to consider, and these are the four things. The, re the reality of pluralism, it can't be denied. You know, we live in a religiously plural uh, environment. The problem of tolerance Certainly, you know that this is um, an issue, you know, the whole rise of tolerance and what tolerance means and, and how this uh, secular view of tolerance is being shoved down our throat. The truth of truth, what is truth and, and what role does it have in understanding other religions? And then uh, finally tonight, what does coexistence really mean? So the reality of pluralism, you know, you can't deny it uh, that as Americans, our nation has changed significantly, things are not the same today as they were 50 or 60 or 100 years ago. Listen, even 20 or 10 years ago. There is a, a multiculturalism that we're exposed to, which, which you know, I'm going to share this in just a minute, but I think, that, I think that it's good. But that multiculturalism brings multiple belief systems and worldviews. You know, someone calculated the number of different religions, and, and I can't say that, that I know for a fact that this number is accurate, but as they calculated the number of different religions um, and philosophies and beliefs, they concluded that there were 4,200 different world religions. Isn't that, isn't that unbelievable to, to, uh, to conceive and to consider that over the course of time, there are so many different views on how... Uh, we approach God, or who is God, or how many gods are there? And it is a big challenge for Christians. You know, not that pluralism is a new thing, because Christianity was birthed in religious pluralism. This was the way the Roman government operated. Uh, when they would go in, depending on how the particular city or country uh, responded to to Roman imperialism, if they responded in a positive way, they allowed those cultures to keep their religious beliefs intact. They, in fact, they honored their religious beliefs. So much so that if you went to Rome back during the day of Paul or Jesus, every different religious belief system would have been represented in Rome. And that was, that was the environment that Christianity was birthed into. And so it's not that this concept of multiple religions or religious pluralism is new, but in a sense, it is new for us that live in this country. And I think that uh, there is a new significance to the issue and certainly should be a new urgency to be able to understand. We need to understand uh, what religious pluralism is 
um, the impact it has on Christianity and how we are effectively able to defend our faith. You know, and, and as we think about that, there's four things that I want you to consider. Um, it is a fact. You know, there was a point in time where religions were geographically isolated. So you could take a look at the world and, you know, by, by uh, geographic orientation, you could identify main stream religions, you know, the larger religions, and they typically would have been isolated in specific geographic locations. But you know, technology um, and advances in travel have flattened the world, so much so that in any given workplace, you can be working with the Sikh, you can be working with the Buddhist, you can be working with the Muslim, you can be working with an atheist, this is absolutely true on the college campus. You know, the exposure to multiple religions, maybe more than anywhere else, is evidenced on the college campus. So the reality of pluralism can't be denied. It's a fact. Um, in addition to that, there is uh, the numerical dominance of the church in third world environments. And that's important for us to understand as well. The majority, by that I mean this, the majority of the church exists in third world environments, typically, not always, but typically third world environments are dominated by other religions, and oftentimes those religions are hostile towards the Christian faith, you know, and I can give multiple examples. Uh, for instance, China, or Iran, or North Africa. You know, in those places, unlike in America, in those places, following Christ, being water baptized, declaring yourself to be a Christian can cost you your life. Not only monetary uh, persecution, but social persecution, excommunication from your family, and sometimes even death just for following Jesus Christ. So, you know, we do have the tendency sometimes just to see things through an American lens. But let me just remind you, the church is bigger than the church in America. There's a big church out there. This is one of the reasons why, listen, I want to encourage you guys to go on missions trips with us. To be able to go into a, a region like North Africa and to spend time with Christians who, who literally, when they go to church, you know, for many years... The church in Tunisia was underground because of the, the fierce opposition to the gospel. But there was a handful of believers that decided, listen, you know what? We're just going to be vocal about our faith. We're going to come up from living underground, and we're just going to trust God. And, you know, as they did that, the church began to multiply. Um, and, you know, it's interesting even to consider that in Tunisia, the church was dead for almost 1,300 years uh, in the 6th century AD, as Islam swept into North Africa, uh, it targeted the church leaders. The idea was this, you cut the head off the snake, the snake dies. The way the church was oriented around bishops um, lent itself to this. So when Christian leaders were put to death for their faith, the church began to die. The, the, the Christians began to disperse. And for almost 1,300 years, there was no Christian representation in what used to be the jewel of Christianity. You know, the school of Carthage and Alexandria, these were the places of Christian learning in the early church. And then just about 30 years ago, God, by his grace, rebirthed the church of Jesus Christ, not of Latter-day Saints, the church of Jesus Christ in North Africa. And you know, what an opportunity, what a privilege to be able to, to see that. I think sometimes, not that we are intentionally ethnocentric, but you know, we can be so focused on what happens in America, we forget the reality that the church is bigger uh, than, in, than in America. Uh, you know, and it's true that the fastest growing church is in China, number one, and, in, and in Iran, number two. So the numerical dominance of the third world church is something we need to consider. Um, in addition to that, just with this issue of pluralism in mind, there is a, a growing, fragile interdependence among nations. And so by that, I mean this. A couple of years ago, when we had our prophecy update, you know, typically during a prophecy update, I'll pick uh, the word of the year and we'll kind of orient the prophecy update around the word of the year. Well, I think two or three years ago, the word was globalism. 
And you know, we understand the book of Revelation. Uh, we know what everything's moving towards, that there's gonna be a, a one world leader, that this one world leader is going to unite uh, the nations in, under a one world government. And you know, we see the beginnings of that today. And there is this growing, fragile interdependence among nations. As a result, there is also a global effort to minimize religious friction. Because if the goal ultimately is to have one, a one world religion, you can't, have, you can't have religions fighting against each other. And so there is a global effort underway um, to uh, homogenize all religions under one religious heading. The fourth thing that, I, it, it, that all leads us to is a religious pluralism that demands religious tolerance. You know, all of this, like you think this through and uh, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to come to this conclusion. You know where it's all going. You know that pluralism, religious pluralism from a secular point of view is gonna put people in a position where ultimately a secular concept of tolerance is demanded. And that's the second thing I want you to consider tonight. There is a, a problem of tolerance, at least from the Christian perspective that we deal with, because our belief uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and the pathway to God is exclusive. And as we're gonna talk about in just a minute, um, that concept that concept of exclusive truth is not unique just to Christianity. But there is a problem of tolerance as this idea of religious pluralism is in a sense shoved down people's throats. The conclusion that people come to is that all religions must then be equally true. And when we talk about religions coexisting, like if you're talking to someone who's not a Christian, a secular person, maybe an atheist, and you're discussing religious pluralism, different religions and their belief systems, oftentimes this is what you'll hear people say. Hey, you know what? Uh, as long as you're sincere, how many of you have heard this before? As long as you're sincere, that's all that matters. As if, in the end, God is just going to judge you on sincerity, which by the way, he's not going to do. But this is the secular idea out there, that as long as you're sincere in your belief, then what's good for you is good for you. And at the end of the day, the secular mind would say, all religions really are equally true. Now look, I think that we live in a consumer-driven global culture, right? I mean, this is, this is really what the world is becoming. We purchase what we want. We listen to what we want at the click of a button. It's all on demand. And if it is all on demand, I mean, you can order anything off of Amazon.com. And if it is all on demand, then why isn't religion the same? As long as it's meeting your needs, as long as it's fulfilling your desires. And so there's this subjective attitude towards religion that as long as it's meaningful, to the individual, then it must be true. Um, and you know, when we think about the coexist symbol, how many of you guys have seen this symbol before? Go ahead and click that button. You've seen that symbol before? Okay, is this, I just asked, is this on your bumper? Let me, because we have, we have security checking tonight, the cars to see <laughs> if this is on, on your bumper. Maybe it's your screen saver. Uh, you guys have seen this before. Raise your hand if you've seen it before. I'm just curious. All right, and you know, you, this is what you have. You have Islam. Uh, you have new ageism in the O. Um, you have the equality between genders in the E. Some would say that uh, that represents science as well. So science being a religion that people worship. You have the star of David representing Judaism. You have the, the pentagram over the I that represents Wicca. Uh, you have the yin and the yang in the S that represents uh, Buddhism. And then you have the T uh, which represents Christianity. Now, if there's 4,200 world religions, I would say that this word needs to be a little bit longer, but I don't know of a word that's 4,200 4, letters long. Uh, but this is the idea. You know, this is what's presented to us in our culture, that all of these different religions, all of these uh, mainline religions that do really represent the vast majority of people living on the face of the earth today are all equally true. 
And you know, sometimes the truth is this. Sometimes when that argument comes your way as a Christian, you know what? You can feel bad for saying, no, that's not true. Or you can feel a little defensive, maybe even a little overwhelmed that somebody is presenting this to you because, because you think, you know, and even as you present it, even, you know, when you're in that spot and you're claiming the exclusiveness of the way to God through the person of Jesus Christ, you know oftentimes the reaction that you get um, can be vitriolic. Sometimes it can be absolutely violent. You know, people look down at you for being so exclusive, almost as if, you know, who do you think you are for claiming that you have the only way to God? And, you know, sometimes it can even mean persecution. So this is the reality of what you and I deal with today. But the fact is this, you have to remember the truth of truth. You have to remember the truth of truth. And, and the fact is, truth is undeniable. You know, the more you deny the existence of truth, the more you prove it. I was on a college campus about eight years ago. We were at UNLV, we had a panel. Um, and, and the question was, does, does God exist? And you know, we invited the college campus, uh, the school newspaper was out, the place was absolutely packed, and, um, and it was a really good night, you know, it was a great night of ministry, but I remember talking to students afterwards, and one student in particular was irate, totally irate that I had the audacity, that I had the pride, that I had the hubris to claim that I knew truth. And his point, as he was aggressively making it, was this. There is absolutely no such thing as truth. And the interesting thing is, the more he shouted and the angrier he got, and the, the more exclusive his point was, the more he proved my point, that truth does in fact exist. Because if all things are relative, then you can't say that something's false. Do you understand that? If all things are relative, if there's no such thing as truth, then you can't claim that anything is false because you have no basis of truth to make that claim from. So it's actually, you know, you flip the whole argument on its head and you see the contradiction that exists. So truth, listen, truth is undeniable. You don't have to be ashamed or afraid of that. Truth is exclusive. Truth by definition, this was what Ravi Zacharias said some years ago, truth by definition is exclusive. Everything cannot be true. If everything is true, then nothing is false. And if nothing is false, then it would also be true to say that everything is false. Did you get that? Okay, I'll email that to you later on and you can, you can think about that for a while. You know, Jesus claimed truth. He claimed truth, and not only did he claim truth, but he claimed to be truth itself. He didn't just claim to be the truth, he claimed to be truth. He said in John 14, 6, tonight, this is our verse, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now look, we don't make those words up. The exclusive claims of Christ, you know, are not generated by the church. They're generated by Jesus himself. And Jesus, Jesus wasn't one who backed down from the truth of truth. He wasn't somebody who soft-pedaled the concept of truth. He, in fact, claimed to be truth incarnate. John 18, 37, you remember the dialogue with Pilate. I mean, this was one of the strongest uh, affirmations of the existence of truth that Christ ever made. And as he even mentioned truth, you remember Pilate in that cynical, secular sense, because Pilate had grown up. He'd grown up in this pluralistic culture. He was an individual who was cynical concerning, uh, you know, human nature. And he, he responded to Jesus when Jesus proclaimed truth. He said, what is truth? And so many people today in this cynical, religiously plural culture that we live in feel the same way about truth. But Jesus said, you say rightly that I am a king, he said to Pilate. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Christ himself, 
The reality is, you don't have to be embarrassed of truth. You don't have to be ashamed of truth. You don't have to, to backpedal from expressing the exclusivity of truth because Jesus himself not only claimed to be the truth, but he said that everyone who is of the truth hears his voice. So we live in the reality of pluralism. You know, there is the problem of tolerance that all of us deals with in the secular sense of tolerance. But don't ever abandon the concept of truth because if you do, then everything is fair game. But what does coexistence really mean? When we talk about coexistence and when people talk about religions coexisting, what is it that they really mean? I just want to um, remind you tonight that world religions are by nature incompatible. If you study world religions, and I'll tell you tonight, I'm not necessarily an expert on the diversity um, and the specifics of different world religions, but you don't necessarily have to be an expert to know that world religions are by nature incompatible. And they're incompatible, listen, because each of them makes specific truth claims. You know, it's often said, all religions are fundamentally the same and only superficially different. And you know, the reality is the opposite is true. All religions are fundamentally different and superficially the same. It's not that you have all of these different approaches to God that are really at the core similar. There are superficial similarities. There are ethics. There are not, not necessarily across the board, but there are ethics and there are ways of living and there are moral standards in a superficial official sense that are similar, but really when you get down to the nuts and bolts of the different world religions, at the core, they are all significantly different. Each of them makes specific truth claims. Next time somebody says to you, you know you Christians, you're all alike. You know, you make these exclusive truth claims. You know, you can rightfully respond, Christianity is not the only a world religion that makes specific truth claims. Every single world religion does. Let me just quote Ravi Zacharias again. He said, the truth is that every major religion in the world claims exclusivity, and every major religion in the world has a point of exclusion, without exception. So the whole notion tonight um, that somehow uh, Christianity is unique in this sense is just not true. Let me give you an example. Hinduism is often re represented as being the most tolerant and accepting of other faiths, and the reality is it's not true. All Hindus believe in two fundamental, uncompromising doctrines, the law of karma and the belief in reincarnation. And, and these dogmas will not be surrendered. And maybe you don't know this, but Buddhism was born out of the rejection of two other dogmatic claims of Hinduism. Buddha rejected the authority of the Vedas and the caste system of Hinduism. And so even in these two uh, large world religions, the issue wasn't necessarily who was right or wrong, but each of them had systematic truth that was opposite to the other. Or consider Islam and Christianity. If you go to Israel with me, and we're up on the Temple Mount, um, and you know the Temple Mount really is dominated by the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim structure. You know we believe as Christians that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father, very God of very God. This is our belief. And on the Dome of the Rock, on that edifice, around the outside, there's Arabic writing. And the Arabic writing says this. It says, uh, God does not beget, nor is he begotten. It says, God has no son. Now, I'm just saying to you today, how can you say that all religions are equally true when they claim things that contradict one another? This is, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, this is the law of non-contradiction. Something can't be true and false at the same time. It's not possible. And you know, at the end of the day, even the secular person understands this. Somebody straps 
a bomb to themselves, and they roll into a, a community, or they roll into a, a crowded urban area, and they blow themselves up, you know, very few people are saying, well, listen, as long as they're sincere about their beliefs, you know, what's good for them is good for them, and what's good for me is good for me. Nobody is saying that. Nobody is saying that a suicide bomber with bombs strapped to them or somebody jumping in the cockpit of an airplane has the freedom because of sincerity to believe whatever they want to believe. Absolutely not true. Even the secular person ultimately bases an understanding of right and wrong off of truth. And so uh, world religions themselves, world religions themselves differ in the most substantial way at the core of each belief. So this idea of all religions coexisting as equally true is just totally false, number one. Um, so they can't coexist in that sense. But how do we, and I think that this is really the main question I wanna answer tonight, how do we as Christians coexist with other religions, with people of other religious faiths? And I think that we are called to coexist but we're called to coexist with purpose. I wanna kind of frame it like this tonight. Um, I believe in something called the missionary encounter. Um, I believe that every time that you are exposed to or you have the opportunity um, to interface with somebody of a different fa faith, I believe that that is a missionary encounter. I don't think it's an accident. I don't think that it's just happenstance. Um, I don't think that it's a coincidence. I think, and I know that you probably believe this with me, um, I think that God ordains those moments, that God superintends them because we're called to be the light of the world. And you know we are called to coexist, not in the sense of um, tolerating other religions as equally true, but coexisting with purpose. We are called to be the light of the world. We are called to convey the truth and love. You know, we're called to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that every uh, individual of another faith that we engage with is really an opportunity, and the purpose is ultimately their salvation. Um, behind every question is a questioner. Um, sometimes I do think in this multicultural, religiously uh, pluralistic environment that we live in, sometimes I do think that we can be more interested in being right um, than reaching the person. We can be more interested in winning the argument than winning the soul. And so, look, I just wanna remind all of us today, it's not just about winning the argument. It's not just about being able to, to make your point. There's a, a questioner behind every question. And you know what, if somebody is asking you questions about your faith, look, I think that that's a good thing. It's, it's, a, it's a bridge that God is building for you to share truth with somebody else who is really in need. And I think that we're kind of like in this um, place where we have more opportunities than ever. I love living in Las Vegas. I love how multicultural um, our city is. People come literally from all over the world. Did you guys know that we have 52 million visitors every single year? Isn't that crazy? And from, from almost every culture, look, you don't have to go into the mission field. The mission field comes to you. And, and you guys are out in it. Look, you're out in it every single day, whether you're just going about your normal business or whether you're working in the industries down there, in the casinos or you know, in a service industry. You get people from all different faiths. And, and I would just say to you tonight, man, what an opportunity. You know, more than ever, we are seeing uh, migrations of people moving in to areas uh, where there's an availability of the gospel. Now listen, however you feel about the issue of refugees, you know, in a political sense, or, or even in the sense of how we handle that as a, a, as a government um, or as a nation, you know, those questions are important. But, but the truth is this, you have Muslims by the millions who are moving from Muslim-dominated countries where there's no exposure to the gospel where they cannot freely just ask somebody about the person of Jesus Christ, where they've gotta go online undercover if they have questions to, to a website like Ma'arifa, so they could ask somebody about this person of Christ and if he is who the Quran really says that he is, 
You know, there's an opportunity today where those people are coming out of those countries and they are exposed 24-7 to believers in Jesus Christ and the opportunity to freely go to church. And I'm just saying, look, we can have all sorts of opinions about how all of that should work. And I do have opinions. But I think that this is an opportunity for us to get souls into the kingdom of God like never before. And I think, anybody with me? Bunch of people mad. Just curious. I think, I think that at the end of the day, this is what it's about. You know, it's, it's about heaven being full. It's about God being glorified. It's about every tribe, every ethnicity, um, uh, every unique language group being in heaven, praising God in their own tongues. Don't you want that? I mean, think about how diverse heaven is going to be. Diver Heaven's not going to be just white bread, y'all. Okay? It's not just going to be white bread. It is going to be every tribe and every tongue. And you know what? If you don't like cultural diversity here right now, you're going to hate heaven. Okay? You can get mad at me later for that. But I, I just appreciate, I appreciate cultural diversity. And I think heaven obviously is going to be the most culturally uh, diverse place we have ever seen. And so this is what we do. We don't shrink back in fear. We don't, we don't self-righteously judge other people who are lost, who've been raised in, you know, another religion with a different worldview. We don't just judge them by looking on the outside because of the apparel they're wearing. We recognize that they are people who are made in the image of God, that God loves so much that he sent his only begotten son for. Are you willing to be that bridge? Are you willing to take that step? Are you willing to see people like this? Are you willing to be an ambassador for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Every person, every person has four major questions to answer in their life. And these are the four questions. They revolve around these four things, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Like if you're really a sincere thinker, if you're really a sincere seeker, these are four fundamental questions that every person needs to understand origin. How did I get here? I'm not talking about the birds and the bees. Origin, how did I get here? Meaning, what is the purpose of my life? Morality, how do I behave? What are the guidelines? What are the standards that I operate my life by and I make my decisions from? And then destiny, think about the importance of this final question, destiny. What happens after this life? Where am I going? I believe that the gospel, and by the way, Every worldview has to comprehensively and coherently answer all four of those questions. And the, the burden of that is on each of those worldviews or each of those religions. You know, they're the ones. Each religion has to be able to stand the test of truth, to, pro to provide a comprehensive, cohesive answer to origin, to meaning, to morality, and to destiny. And I would suggest to you that the gospel answers those four questions like no other worldview, like no other world religion. The gospels teach us that we're made by God. The gospel teaches us that we're purposed to worship him. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that we're to live for his glory. And the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches that we have the opportunity to live with God forever. All of that revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In his incarnation, through his perfect life, by his death on the cross, and because of his resurrection. Jesus, among all religious leaders, Jesus is absolutely unique and there is no one like him. He is unparalleled and he is awesome. If you ask a Muslim, how is it that they're going to obtain paradise, this is what you'll get as an answer. Well, the good works outweigh the bad works. And as long as I have plenty of good works, then I'll obtain paradise. If you ask the Hindu or the Buddhist, they would say, well, you know, in each life you occur a debt. And in the rebirth, in the next life, you pay for that debt. 
if you ask the Christian, they say, it's the cross. We can't pay the debt. We are by nature sinful and depraved. We can't earn our way out of it. We can't work our way out of it. We can't buy our way out of it. No other person can offer it to us except Jesus Christ, who alone, he alone, like no other individual, self-sacrificially gave himself as a mediator between man and God and died on a cross in our place and paid a penalty that each of us deserved to pay for our sins forever, for all of eternity. All of us have earned death, but the grace of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is John 1, 14, where the Bible says this, and the word became flesh, and the eternal word of God, the one who was with God. The word became flesh, he took on a human body, he was incarnate, he was divinely, by the agency of the Holy Spirit, placed into the virgin womb of Mary, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. He was numbered among the transgressors. He walked with his creation. He left the glory of heaven and the adulation of angels. He condescended like no one has ever condescended before. Look, it was an eternal step down. Man, you think you make sacrifices when you minister to people? Think about the person of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made when you stepped away from the throne of heaven and was placed divinely into the womb of Mary and then lived a life of self-sacrifice, a perfect life. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Like this is what John is saying, man, check it out. We saw him, we walked with him, we beheld. Like every day, every minute of every day was like a wow moment, an amazing moment. Can you believe this man? Kind of like Pilate said, remember after Christ had been scourged, Pilate brought him before the Jewish people who were thirsty for the blood of Jesus because of his divine claims. And this was what Pilate said. Pilate said, behold the man, as he stood there a bloody mess, as he'd been scourged and beaten beyond recognition, Pilate, I think, was saying, man, have you ever seen any man like this man? Have you ever seen a, a man like this who has suffered almost as if he was intended for this moment? Have you ever seen, by the way, Pilate as a governor knew a guilty man when he saw a guilty man? Have you ever seen this, a, a man like this, a righteous man who suffered innocently, Falsely accused, behold the man, there is no one like the person of Jesus Christ. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Son. There's one Son who was begotten. There's the Father, there's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All unique persons, but all equally God simultaneously. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full, pleureo, overflowing with truth and with grace. There's no one like Jesus Christ. Christianity is the only re religion with a message of redemption. Ravi Zacharias said this. He said, the greatest ethic is love. Where love is a possibility, freedom has to be given. Where freedom, excuse me, where there is freedom, there is always the possibility of sin. Where there is sin, there is the need of a savior, where there is a savior, there is the possibility of redemption. So look, you have love, you have redemption, and in the middle holding those two things together is Jesus Christ himself. He is at the center. The love of God demonstrated through the Son, bringing redemption, purchasing you and me back from our sins to be reconciled to God forever. That is, un that is the unique message of Christianity, and I can say this exclusively, there is no other religion that has a message uh, that declares that one man died for the sin of all human beings. He's worthy of worship. Man, he's worthy of praise. He's worthy to be declared. He's worthy to be shared. You know, you don't, you don't have to coerce people into believing. 
Proselytizing people is not coercing them or forcing them. You can't argue anybody into the kingdom of God. Your job is to be an ambassador of Christ, to live the life, to present the gospel, and as you do that, the spirit of God changes people. Sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, you know what, God used me today. I saved five people. And I say, bro, you didn't save nobody, okay? God does the saving. God does the saving. Look, from time to time, when we share the gospel after a service, there are times where no one responds. And, and you know, people will come to me, hey, pastors, sorry, man, you got snubbed today, you know? <laughs> you, you, you struck out today. And you know, I think there was a point in time in my life where I would like get down from the pulpit and I'd be discouraged, you know, and I'd be thinking, you, what a loser, man, what a lame message that was. And uh, while that may be true, While that may be true, God is the one who saves. God is the one who delivers. You know, I I get down, I'm like, look, I did my job, okay? I did my job. I presented the truth. Now, look, the Spirit of God is the one who woos people to the Son and convicts people of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And the person sitting in the seat has the decision to make for themselves that they will be responsible to God for Kind of like Paul said, I did not shun to declare the whole counsel of the word of God. I am innocent of the blood of all men. And so, look, I want to encourage you. You don't, sometimes we put unnecessary burden upon ourselves. Man, I can't do that. I can't save anybody. No, you can't. Look, you got the easiest job of all. All you do is have to share the truth in love. All you do is have to make sure at the end of the day, your message comes back to the cross of Christ. Dealing with other religions and sorting out the differences is sometimes necessary. But look, I call that, I call that the shrubs. You got to get to the core. Sometimes you got to get through the periphery to get to the real issue. And the real issue is the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. And then the truth, remember, is this. God loves the soul. The person you're talking to, there is a God in heaven who loves that individual. And you know, when you have the opportunity in your moment to share, there is a whole history of work behind the scenes, under the water, behind the veil, that God has been doing, and you and I just have a peace. You know, I'm privileged, you guys, to be able to uh, see a harvest of souls, but the fact is, like, make no mistake, the reality is you guys do the hard work. Oftentimes, it's your investment. You know, it's your consistent love and faithfulness. It's your example. It's you inviting people. And then, you know, there's just the opportunity to see people respond to the gospel when the gospel is presented, but the hard work is done oftentimes by you. But I just want to encourage you in that moment when you have an opportunity to share, don't think that it all comes down to you in the moment because God is already at work in that individual's life. Blaise Pascal, the great scientist, said this. He said, Jesus is the God whom we can approach without pride and before whom we can humble ourselves without despair. And I love that, I think it's beautiful. The great prayer warrior, Count Zinzendorf, said this, I have one passion, it is he, only he. And so I wanna encourage you tonight, Jesus is our message. At the end of the day, uh, when it boils down to really the core of our message, it's the person of Christ. It's not the church, it's not what our church does, It's not the different ministries, it's Jesus Christ and what Jesus offers to every single individual. Can you say amen with me tonight? Father, we bless your name. God, just thankful tonight for salvation and how you saved us. God, you revealed your truth to us. You opened up our eyes. You worked through your Holy Spirit in our hearts. God, over the course of time, and some of us came the hard way, but we're thankful to be here tonight. 
We're thankful to have had the opportunity to hear the gospel that you loved us enough to send an ambassador our way. God, you loved us enough to raise somebody up who shared the truth and showed us love and and served us even in our worst moments. And God, as we're thankful for that tonight, we just make our confession to you. We want to be that to people. God, of every ethnicity, of every religious background, Father, we want to remember that what matters most is eternal life and that this life is just a vapor and that every soul ultimately needs you and that your son is the answer. God, I pray that you'd bless my brothers and sisters just with unique opportunities to fearlessly and lovingly and humbly share the truth and that you would demonstrate the power of the gospel through their lives and that you would save God, save the needy, save the broken, save the lost, save the wayward. God, reach into these areas geographically that are filled with unreached people who've never even had the opportunity to hear the name of Jesus. God, we want them to know. We want them to be exposed. We want them to hear the truth. And so, God, we avail ourselves to you once again. And we pray that you would use us as we confess to you our desire to fulfill the Great Commission. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and as we're in an attitude of prayer, look, I just want to ask tonight, you know, maybe maybe you've considered many religions, and I know what that's like. I was in that spot, you know. I dabbled in all sorts of religious beliefs. But tonight, you know, you've You've heard about Jesus and the love of God and what Christ did for you on the cross and how he did for you what you could not do for yourself. Through his incarnation, his perfect life, his crucifixion and his resurrection, he is what your heart has been longing for the whole time. He is the fulfillment of of every need that you have. He is the way to redemption and reconciliation to God the Father. There is no other mediator between man and God. There's no one else who can stand between you and God. Only Jesus Christ can. And you know, he beckons you to come. He doesn't push you away. He calls you to come. His desire is that you would come to him just as you are and to receive the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing of your heart and the new life that he wants to give you and the assurance. Listen, you can know your destiny. You don't need tarot cards read. You don't need tea leaves turned It says it in the word of God, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you will inherit everlasting life. Tonight, if you wanna take this step of faith, if you wanna look to Jesus Christ, I wanna pray for you. I believe that God has brought you here. I don't think it's just an accident that you're here. You know, maybe you've been raised in the church, but the truth is this, you don't have your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what? The church is not the mediator. He is the mediator, and he calls you to come to God through him. And so this evening, if this is you, you want to take that step of faith and believe in Jesus Christ, I want to pray for you tonight, right where you're sitting. I'm just going to ask you to do something simple. Would you raise your hand this evening? Would you stretch your hand up high so I can see who you are? You want to take that step of faith, and you want to look to Christ. God bless you. Thank you so much for raising your hand. And here, and here. That's awesome. So good. Anybody else? Just be bold tonight. Let me see who you are. Give me the opportunity to pray for you. Stretch your hand up high. All right, you guys can put your hands down. Tonight, if you're a Christian and 
You know, the truth is this, that while you've believed in the gospel, you know your life really isn't aligned to the desires of God, and you just need to rededicate your life to Christ. You need to recommit right here and right now. You need God to do something fresh. You need renewal. While you know Jesus, you need to grow in your love relationship with him. Maybe there are sins that you need to lay down. Maybe there's a lukewarmness in your life that needs to be repented of. You know, he loved you so much, and he is worthy of living a life for his glory. Tonight, Christian, is this you? You need to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. I want to pray for you tonight. Would you raise your hand? Let me see who you are. God bless you. Awesome. I see your hand over here on my left and right here in the center. And over here, I see both your hands in the back. It's awesome. Thank you guys for raising your hands. That's great. Father, thank you. You can put your hands down. God, thank you so much for these precious souls that you love. God, fearfully and wonderfully made, your word says, created in your image and the object of your love. Tonight, I pray that you'd strengthen them to take this step of faith to believe in your son. Right where you guys are sitting tonight, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. Okay, I've prayed for you. Now you need to pray. God wants a relationship with you through his son, Jesus. And so tonight, um, as you're sitting, I want to lead you in this very simple prayer, a prayer of confession, a prayer of faith in the gospel. So I want you to follow me in this simple prayer tonight. God, tonight, I give you my life. And God, I confess that I've sinned against you. Tonight, I believe in Jesus, that he died for me, and that he rose again, and that through faith in him, you've forgiven me, you filled me with your spirit, and you've given me the gift of heaven. God, thank you for loving me. I give you my life tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.